Hi everyone, welcome to the ninth lecture of the Oscillation Debate Training Platform. My name is um, Adi. I'll be uh, talking about international relations today. So, uh, just a disclaimer before uh, moving forward with the lecture. Uh, so, I'm not an IR expert in terms of just discussing military strategies or um, economic policies and, and other stuff because obviously there are people who know that a lot better than I do. Uh, but the reason why I enjoy IR debates the most is because of the technicalities that are involved i.e. for example trying to analyze particular actors or institutions and how they would essentially react to particular situations and that's the thing that we'll fo focus more on within this lecture so it won't be filled with, with a lot of facts uh, but what it will essentially contain is a lot of nitty-gritty strategies in terms of how to apply certain uh, you know tricks in uh, in IR debates that will help you win those particular debates and how you can best use a lot of the facts that essentially uh, you know you've read upon in IR debates as a whole so I, I hope essentially this will be very useful for you okay so firstly in terms of the basics of IR debates now most IR debates and most IR motions are basically dependent on actors and how they react to particular uh, situations so regardless of essentially whatever motion uh, your whatever motion you get it it is almost always dependent on actors and um, how actors will react uh, to particular things uh, particular things that actually uh, happen uh, to them as a whole. So, for example, what if it's the if, if the motion is about Myanmar and how you want to put sanctions on them uh, if they don't put the government back in power, or if it's about you know whether or not Israel should unilaterally attack Iranian nuclear facilities. All of these uh, motions are essentially dependent on these particular actors. What are the incentives to act in the way you want them to act, or uh, or you know, or how are they going to react when certain things essentially happen to them are they likely to be aggressive are they likely to surrender etc etc so i think the key in ir debates uh, in a nutshell is just to focus on the actors that are essentially involved in the motion uh, how will they react to a particular policy and whether or not is it is in, it is in the incentive to do essentially what you want them to do now obviously in all debates in general uh, because if an if a score has given a lot of thought behind a particular ir motion which means that there will always be two sides to the coin which means the incentive that you tend to argue, there will obviously always be a good counter incentive and the team that essentially uh, shows that their incentives align the best with the actor uh, actor uh, is the team that essentially ends up winning the debate more often than not, right? So, yeah, like the simplest uh, tip for IR debates is focus on the particular actors, how they would they react to particular situations and whether or not it's, their in, it's in their incentive to do what you want them to do. Okay. So there are two ways to determine how an actor might react to a particular situation. Now the first thing is with, with whether or not is it what is what is the incentive of the actor to essentially do what you uh, do what you want them to do. So for example, if the motion is about Iran uh, trying to uh, attack, uh, if the motion is about Israel trying to attack Iranian nuclear facilities, uh, the first question you have to ask them is whether or not it's with the incentive of Iran uh, instead of Israel to do so. And obviously if their national security is threatened you can obviously argue that it is within the incentives to do as such so that's why it's a credible enough claim to make that yes uh, they should be able to should, they should do these things because this is something that will end up benefiting them or this is something that they essentially care about which is why it's likely that they will be able to essentially uh, you know do do these uh, particular things or say for example uh, if the motion is about say if the motion is about you being Iran, like this house as Iran, would essentially uh, attempt uh, uh, attempt to start a war with Saudi Arabia. Uh, in this particular uh, situation, if someone makes the argument that uh, Iran doesn't want to do this because that means that the U.S. will get involved, and if the U.S. gets involved, uh, this is bad news for Iran uh, in ways in, in in many ways. And then the question that anyone is going to ask is why would the U.S. want to get involved? Does the U.S. have an incentive to get involved in a war with Saudi Arabia and Iran? And that's when you can say that yes, it is definitely within the incentive of U.S. U.S. to get involved because uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia is a historical ally. They they are watchdogs for them in the Middle East, etc., etc. Right? So every single time you make a claim in an IR debate about a particular actor getting involved in a particular uh, situation, you have to outline their incentive and just show that it is within their incentive to do so because the, the first thing your opposition is going to say whenever uh, whenever you make a bit of a you know 
newish or an outlandish claim in an IR debate is that this does this just does not align with the interest of the incentive of the actor that you try to propose. So that's why I think incentives are particularly important to align or uh, to highlight whenever you are arguing about how an actor is actually like react in a particular situation. The second thing is then the uh, capability of the particular actor in question. So whether or not the actor is capable capable of pulling off what you want what you want them to pull off pull off. So say for example, um, if the motion wants uh, if the motion wants you to argue uh, that whether or not Iran uh, should be involved in warfare with Saudi Arabia, uh, the question that you have to ask yourself is that does Iranian military or Iranian government have the capability of running a war with uh, Saudi Arabia? And if you are opposition over here, I think a very nice line of argument is that uh, their economy is absolutely in the gutters, all their allies, this Russia and China are struggling as well, which is why it's very, very unlikely that they will be backed, backed up during this war, so a war in general is a bad idea. Because even though Iran might have the incentive to go to war with Saudi Arabia because of uh, because of hegemony or moral superiority or or whatnot, they simply don't have the capability to do so. So whenever uh, so whenever capability is an ally, it doesn't matter whether or not you essentially have uh, the interest. So for, so for an actor to essentially do what you want them to do in an IR debate, these two things have to align to each other, i.e., incentive and capability. One cannot uh, one cannot work without the other. Both things need to work simultaneously for you to establish that the actor is going to do what you want them to do, right? So these are the two things that you should keep in mind while uh, thinking about how an actor reacts, especially specifically in an IR debate. All right. So determining incentives and how they essentially uh, work. Okay. So the first thing about incentive, or how do you determine what incentive a particular actor has? Uh, there are a few ways in which you can do that. Number one is that like uh, certain countries and their ruling elite of the par particular country uh, are a very good indicator of how what the country's incentive structure might look like. Especially in countries, say for example, that don't really uh, you know like have a democratic structure, i.e., the likes of Russia or China. So in whenever you're acting, uh, whenever you're arguing about things like say for example, a country like uh, Russia or China. And they want to do something with their military, i.e., invade a particular country, etc., etc. I think you can just easily say that they will. They have. It's an incentive. It's within their incentive to do so, and they will be able to do so uh, because they they aren't really a democratic structure. So in countries that are like aren't really democratic, uh, the people who are ruling the country have an unprecedented amount of say over whether over what that country is essentially likely to, likely to do. So like I said, with countries like China and Russia. Uh, you can just claim that the government wants to do this particular thing, and that's why it is within the incentive. People are totally get involved. But the difference over here is, say, for example, a country like America or Germany, uh, do they want? Will they want to go into a war just because they can, or, or they are, are there checks and balances that hold them into play? For example, there are checks and balances in countries like America or Germany, such as the parliament, such as uh, maybe things like lobbyists, uh, things like election cycles, etc., etc. Right. So that's one thing. Uh, when it comes to incentive structures, that uh, people ruling the country definitely uh, dictate the incentive structure of a particular country. So, uh, in countries, like I said, in countries like China or Russia, the incentive structure is as such that if the government wants this particular thing, that is definitely going to happen because that's what they want and they don't have any checks on us in the country. But the second thing is, uh, in countries like America or uh, Germany, uh, because they are strong democracies, Definitely, there's a lot of check and balance as well, but even then, the government does have a lot of sway over whether or not certain thing is likely to happen or unlikely to happen. Uh, the second thing is, in terms of like uh, a country's, I think, nationalistic tendencies are also tend to dictate what the incentive of, this, of that country is. And I think that sort of correlates with the historical narrative part as well. So, for example, if you look at India or Pakistan, both of these countries have a lot of hostility towards each other, and the nationalism within these countries dictates that uh, these countries should definitely be aggressive against each other. So no matter what government comes in power, whether it's a left-wing government uh, uh, or a right-wing government, uh, both sort of governments want to be aggressive against this uh, against the other country because it's within the nationalistic tendencies to essentially do so. So a country's history, a country's uh, past experiences or lived experiences are also a good indicator of what the, what an what the incentive of the country is essentially uh, likely to be in those particular, uh, in those particular, uh, you know, situations. So, for example, if it's a debate about 
like you know uh, land grabbing or, or something like that over over there if it's a minority that's very passionate about the land that they're uh, living in i.e the likes of palestine you are likely to sort of like argue that it's unlikely that the most most people are likely to you know to give up a lot of, lot of their lands because of the historical narrative that exists amongst these individuals right so i think these two are also very good indicators of uh, what an incentive of a country is likely to be the last thing would obviously that dictates your incentive is what you are likely to achieve out of a particular policy so if it means that you are likely to get military uh, military policy uh, or like military benefits or economic benefits or geographical superiority it is likely to be within your incentive to essentially allow uh, allow certain things so for example a good example of this is how is how uh, you know uh, how usa like used opec opec to hurt to hurt the uh, russian economy so the reason why this is particularly interesting is because uh, inter- incentive structures often work in like really really weird ways so say for example uh, opec uh, basically uh, opec basically reduced or saudi arabia basically reduced its oil prices by more than 100 dollars i think in around around 2016 or around 2015 or 16 if i'm not wrong um, and the reason why the usa was okay with that is because even though it essentially hurt the usa's uh, shell oil industry uh, it also hurt the russian economy and the indian economy as well and that's why the us was more than happy to essentially allow uh, saudi arabia to do that because they were because it benefited them as well and it was, it was within their incentive for uh, to allow saudi arabia uh, to do that particular thing right so if if there's anything that gives you some level of military economic or geographical superiority uh, that is going to essentially uh, you know be within the incentive of the particular country uh, to allow for that sort of an action to happen um how do you then determine capability um, for a country's economic and military might goes a long way in determining whether or not they'll be able to do a particular thing the way they wanted to or in terms of international influence as well as local influence as, uh, as well as local influence i uh, you know how much influence does a particular country have in that particular area so for example uh, countries like india they can do whatever they want within their own regions uh, like the sark because they are just way too influential uh, within that particular area uh, because and, and that means that they'll they'll be able to do whatever they want because of the amount of local influence that they have but also when it comes to countries like china and the amount of international clout that they have means that they're likely to get away with, with doing a lot of things that other countries are possibly uh, going to be unable to essentially do so right um, and lastly in terms of like allies and how important they are to them so for example in terms of like capabilities so even though a country might not be directly capable of doing a particular thing just because it has strong allies means that uh, they will be you know they have a lot they will have a lot of uh, license uh, to be able to like you know do certain things without fearing repercussions so say for example this applies to countries like say, saudi arabia who know that this in front of what they do they are likely to have some level of backing from uh, the usa or also might apply to countries like iran as well who know that they are likely to have a lot of backing from countries like russia or china even if things go south for them so that's also a good way of determining capability of a particular actor in terms of the allies that are essentially uh, you know backing them at a particular point of time So these are the some, these are some of the common actors basically used in IR debates. Uh, you can actually list them down and uh, sort of like discuss with your teammates about creating a profile for these particular actors. What the incentives are likely to be, what how much capability do they have over over uh, you know implementing the incentives that they have. I think uh, if you cover these particular um, actors, uh, I think you'll basically have a very good idea of very common IR motions that actually come up. Uh, Uh, that it should come up in ir debates in general so yeah uh, that's basically uh, it for like i incentives and capabilities um, and yeah and these are the these are the actors that you should essentially look out for okay so some debates require an actor to prioritize one incentive over the other so what this basically means is um if we go by a uh, motion to explain this particular uh, part uh, it'll it'll be easier so for example if the motion is the south bidis of the west should impose sanction on myanmar for the atrocities on the rohingya community uh, as of the west over here you will see that there are two things that you have to prioritize so for example as the west 
is very important uh, for you to sort of like highlight uh, the fact that you are against any sort of genocide or ethnic cleansing because it is particularly important for you to maintain human rights and maintain peace and stability all across the world because that's uh, the responsibility that you have taken on, on for yourself. But also as the West, you also understand that Myanmar being a democracy is particularly important as well. And obviously this basically motion was discussed long before the military took over power again. So please try to think about it in that context. Uh, so you also know that if you put uh, sanctions under Myanmar, there's a good chance that the military comes back into power and they become a, become a dictatorship again and they become like close allies with China once again, right? So obviously in this particular situation, it's very important. It's very very important uh, for you to sort of like understand that there are two ways that this can go. And if this debate is about what 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 is good for the West, or uh, you need to sort of like understand that the, there obviously the West has one incentive, which is to um, you know stop uh, you know uh, potential uh, genocides happening. But the West also doesn't want the Man Myanmar uh, country of Myanmar to go back into dictatorship. They have to pick between one or the other, right? And these are the sort of debates where you have a difficult time because both teams are going to argue that it is within your incentive or the actor's incentive to do what they want to do. And both things are essentially uh, good or might be good or might be bad for the particular actor. So in these sort of situations, uh, obviously there is no universal answer in terms of like what is more vital than the other. But what basically what you have to do is essentially contextualize in terms of what do you think is better for the actor at this particular point of time, all right? Uh, so in terms of like contextualizing what is important, uh, you can basically say there are two ways to go about it. Number one is you can just show the urgency of the situation, i.e. that there are people dying, the, 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 the terrorist groups such as ARSA are forming in places like Myanmar, which will cause, which will cause regional uh, instability in the long run. And that's why it's particularly important that we act at this particular point of time, because if we don't, things that just get far, far worse if, uh, in, in the future. But then on the other side, you can uh, also talk about why this is extremely time sensitive and Myanmar just became a democracy quite recently. So we can't really let them go at this particular point of time. So the point of contextualizing what which incentive is more important uh, for the particular actor is basically essentially dependent on your ability uh, to show that what is more urgent for the actor involved at that particular point of time. If you're able to show the urgency, uh, it's easier for you to take that uh, point. But the second thing that you can also try to do is try to show, uh, you can try to show and prior, like, you know, you can prioritize certain things like, say, for example, this in, this particular thing might be more important, but there are more obstacles to achieving this particular goal, which is why we should prioritize the incentive that is, say, easier to achieve, i.e., uh, so, for example, in, in this particular debate, if you're arguing from opposition that we shouldn't put sanctions, you can just say that, okay, Best case scenario, we do put sanctions on them, but there is no guarantee that they will be pressurized by the sanctions to the point where they will stop committing the atrocities. So you put sanctions on, on them, they became a dictatorship and the atrocities continue anyway, which is why this is just much, much more difficult to achieve, which is why, uh, you know, let's just prioritize the incentive that is the easier to achieve, i.e. the one, which is, you know, like not letting them become a dictatorship again. So I think this is what these are the few ways you can actually prioritize these things. I even if you might argue that one incentive is say more important than the other, I'm you're okay with giving up the incentive that is more important for the one that is far more e easily achievable in, in certain situations. All right. So now what we'll do is we'll discuss about certain common themes uh, in IR debates. So one of the first common themes that we get in IR debates are about wars and interventions. So what are modern, uh, what do modern wars look like? I think this is one thing that we actually need to discuss. Uh, so the thing is, uh, wars don't really happen anymore for the for the reasons that they happened in the past, i.e., you know, like kingdoms or like really or empires trying to rule over each other for land, water, and all that stuff. Uh, and so those things don't really happen anymore. Most Modern warfare happens, say, for in places like uh, you know Kashmir, where you have disputed border areas where 
both sides uh, claim that they are rightful owners of uh, a particular piece of land and i think in those situations you will get some uh, war some like level of warfare with undisputed areas uh, that's the first context of warfare that you have in general so i think the reason why this is particularly important uh, to understand is because uh, i think still a lot of debaters make the mistake of trying to characterize wars wars as just like you know outright bloody affairs between two countries but it's a lot more nuanced than that most wars like like i said happen don't happen between full blown militaries of two countries but rather happen in very very like you know small bursts uh, in certain disparate areas like if you follow the uh, you know uh, war that's going on between say india and pakistan for kashmir or between india and china for the you know areas near uh, areas near ladakh um, that's where you'll see um, how these sort of small border skirmishes yeah keep on happening over and over again so most countries don't want to risk an outright war by having their intermediaries involved what happens is these small border skirmishes more often than not in places uh, where there's a disputed area that's first secondly uh, the types of war you'll see our interventions you'll see is for the reason of security or self defense i.e. the things that happened post 9/11 in places like uh, iraq and afghanistan when the us tried to curb down on terrorism uh, after the 9/11 attacks that's another uh, sort of re- reason as to why interventions happen uh, in the modern world second uh, thirdly the type of war that we get to see more frequently are with the ter- likes of terror groups that happen across the world especially in very very like you know uh, destabilized countries or impoverished communities so you know, look at the likes of al shabab in somalia who are fighting with their against their government the likes of boko haram in nigeria who are also essentially fighting uh, who are also essentially fighting with the government i think these are the sort of uh, situations where warfare happens the most where with the with the infight with internal fighting with the terrorist groups specifically um so that's another uh, you know like type of war that goes on currently within uh, within our world the other type of war where that we also get are uh, proxy wars and i think these are mostly like you know like two countries who don't really want to fight each other directly but essentially do it through other countries so this basically happened during the cold war uh when in afghanistan where the us funded the mujahideen to fight like uh, the russian uh, the soviet forces but this is also happening in this like this is like yemen as well or where uh, the saudis are funding the government troops and the uh, iranians are funding like the rebel group and they want to basically do it because saudi arabia wants the sunni government to stay in power iran wants the rebels to be in power because they don't want the sunni government to stay in power and all that stuff so that's how basically that's how basically all these uh why that's how basically how all these warfare or Uh, how a lot of the proxy wars are happening uh, currently in many parts um, across the world so that's another type of warfare that goes on lastly uh, is there are certain countries that might retaliate to certain situations um, this once again is not all, all once again is not all too common but uh, say rather happens in rather happens in like uh, you know certain situations so for example uh, if you look at the if you look at the situation with iran uh what's happening after their general qasim uh, qasim sulaimani essentially uh, got killed was uh, they promised revenge on the actors that essentially uh, were involved in this and that's why they carried out a lot of attacks in places like syria where the actors that they felt were involved uh, you know that committed the killing uh, essentially uh, you know were there and that's when they simply tried to uh kill all, like you know try to execute a lot of attacks in those particular places but once again i don't, I don't think that's a lot lot to common um uh, it happens in specific scenarios but just pointed it out because i felt like this might be relevant in this particular scenario but the first four are the ones uh that are mainly the cause of warfare or interventions in the modern scenario um when debating an intervention motion there are a few things that you should do that will help you uh you know do better like you know uh, be more effective uh the first one is it's always important to show when you are arguing intervention that this is the most um, this is the absolute last resort i e everything else was tried and because everything else did not work um, or it's ineffective of, of working that's why uh that's why you know this particularly can that that's why this particularly has to be done so for example you can argue things like uh there were san- sanctions basically didn't work or 
um, other external embargoes didn't work, negotiations didn't work, and because there is no other way that this particular actor is going to listen to us, what we should do now is just show that uh, this is the absolute last resort, and even if this fails, it doesn't matter, but we need to do this because everything else has failed, right? So what it does is it sort of reduces the pressure on you and puts more pressure on the opposition to show that um, other methods are going to work or would have worked, but uh, if you just do it from the beginning on the onset and just characterize that this is the absolute last resort, the intervention, and everything else has failed before that, uh, it may, it's a very good platform for you to end, uh, win the debate. The second thing you can do while arguing an intervention motion is just to show that our artist is the situation. I.e., if you just talk about, you know, uh, just talk about things like, uh, you know, like how bad the situation is. So if it's the Syrian intervention that you can argue about, I think what a lot of people did at that point of time was essentially talk about how Bashar al-Assad orchestrated the chemical attacks and the situation is just completely gone out of hand and we really, really need to do something about, really need to do something about this at, um, you know, so as to ensure that no, like, no, no more innocent people die or there's no more chemical attacks and all that stuff. You know? So the entire urgency of the situation to, uh, in a uh, in a very, very in, in many cases, uh, they are, uh, will also end up, you know, helping you, like, uh, show the judge as to why it's so urgent that we do the intervention. Right. Uh, the third thing that you need to keep uh, uh, into account while debating an intervention motion is just also in, like, do a lot of focus on not just how the intervention is going to essentially uh, you know, happen, but also the actors that are involved in doing the intervention, i.e., you know, who do you want the intervention to do, uh, intervention to essentially, like, work out with, like, for example, what actor do you essentially uh, think is likely to get involved in the intervention? Secondly, what, is their in, what are their incentives when it comes to uh, the intervention, and why do you think that they are likely to do it in the most efficient manner? So, for example, if it's America carrying it out, what's their incentive to do it, who do they want in power, um, why do you think they have a they have the incentive to do it as efficiently and as peacefully as possible and all that stuff? So, when doing an intervention, obviously there are, the important part is like you know where is the intervention happening? Who do you who do you support? Who do you want to get out of power? Those things are definitely important. But the other thing is also a lot of focus on the actor that you think will take the lead when it comes to doing the intervention and what their incentives are in general. Uh, fourth is just talk about a bit of, bit of stuff within your model in terms of like how ex how fast do you expect the intervention to, to be in terms of like uh, you know what is the realistic picture of how long this is likely to get uh, likely to be carried out in talk about the military might of the opposition the allies that might get involved i.e. one of the main reasons why Syrian intervention was heavily dis discouraged by from from US allies was that they knew that the likes of uh, they knew that the likes of Russia will definitely get involved in this particular, uh, you know, battle. And that's why they were very, very, uh, you know, like they were very, very fast and prompt in terms of saying that, no, we are we are not going to do the intervention because of the amount of, uh, you know, allies that Syria has. And this will lead to like a really, really bad war like, as we go forward in the future. So that's uh, another thing that you need to essentially worry about, that when you're doing the intervention, the people are doing it against, uh, you know, who is the opposition, how long, so you need to take into account how long the intervention might take, and a good way of, um, you know, like, you know, determining is this, like, number one, the might of the opposition we're trying to uh, defeat, and secondly, the allies that they have in general. Um, lastly, post-war reconciliation is also particularly important when it comes to, like, talking about uh, intervention debates. Uh, we'll cover a bit more of that in, in the next slide, uh, but... The reason why post-war reconciliation is very particularly important in the debate is because I think a lot of people just think about intervention debates is that now as long as the intervention is done swiftly, uh, we're more than happy to essentially like, you know, uh, like end the debate right there. But most intervention debates are not just about like, uh, you know, whether or not the intervention is actually successful, but rather also about what happens after the intervention is done, uh, what does the post-war situation look like, and I think a lot of teams just miss out on post-war reconciliation as a whole when it comes to information debates. So once again, just put a lot more focus on that uh, in terms of post-war reconciliation. Okay. The other common theme that we get in uh, IR debates is uh, the one on sanctions. So sanctions are still like the most commonly used hard power for policy tools that the USA uh, uses for regime change. 
So how do sanctions particularly work uh, in general? So the way sanctions work is, um, if you put sanctions on a particular country, it basically means that they can't trade with you and specifically your uh, with your allies as well, which means the country can't export a lot of goods, um, which means that the country has a lot of like you know trouble uh, generating income within their economy. So what happens when they can't generate income within their economy? It means that their economy is absolutely dried out to the bone. So what that basically means is the people within the country, they don't have uh, they don't have money. The elites within the country, they don't have any money whatsoever. And elites uh, of any country obviously need a lot of money. Um, that's why, you know, uh, what the sanctions aim to do is that you dry the economy out. These people feel the pressure. The elites of the country feel the pressure. And then they end up doing what you want them to do. And that's when you ease the sanctions. And that's when they get some amount of money in return. Right? Uh, so in often a lot of cases, you can apply targeted sanctions as well. Which is to say, you can just target specific industries. Uh, and say that we only specifically put sanctions on these specific industries and not other industries so as to ensure that the people are the ones who aren't really suffering but rather it's only the elites that are suffering but the main mechanism like i said of sanctions are that and the and the reason why uh, like a lot like you know sanctions are commonly used is that uh, and not only specific targeted sanctions but like overall sanctions are used because uh, what you want is that you want people in that particular country to get frustrated with the ruling elite. So, for example, if a country, uh, you want to change the regime in a particular country, and you know that uh, that uh, country's uh, people are hungry, they're frustrated, and the first thing that they'll do is they'll ask the government to solve it. And when they, the government can't solve it, they look for other ways to do it. And when you can make this, you'll realize that if you change the government and bring in a new government, remove the sanctions that's when you can have income you can have money and all that stuff that's when uh, these people will want the regime change uh, as well so one of the main reasons why uh, you put sanctions is because you want actually want people to suffer you actually want people to get frustrated and after this people get frustrated they will want regime change they will try and fight for some amount of regime change um have sanctions been effective i think in case of iran and Myanmar, they have so for example in Myanmar, the military junta uh actually uh, like you know the military junta actually essentially like you know uh, gave up their power and gave uh, became a democracy because they realized that you know they need their country needs money and the people are getting frustrated it's like iran as well you have the likes of uh, hassan rouhani a moderate leader coming to power uh, in, a, in a fairly like you know extreme country because people also realize that the enmity with the usa is simply not worth it and we need um, you know someone who can give us jobs so sanctions in those cases, you can say, it, despite taking a long, long time, they have really worked for certain uh, countries, right? Um, the other thing about sanctions that's good is that it's actually non-violent and it always opens uh, room, uh, you know, like uh, room for negotiation. That's one particular good thing as well. Like having a non-violent, having a non-violent, um, you know, uh, mode of regime change that can actually work in general, right? But the flip side to sanctions not working is that. Uh, if you've seen the case of Iran and North Korea as well, the reason why sanctions haven't really worked or have taken a long time to work uh, is because most of these countries have had allies that um, have just have done just enough to essentially help them sustain. So, for example, these are the likes of like for Iran, uh, it's been the likes of China, Russia, and North Korea. For North Korea, it's been the likes of Iran and, and China. For Myanmar as well, it's been the Chinese government for a long, long time who, who essentially helped them, uh, you know, sustain for a long period of time. So sanctions, uh, the reason why they might not work certain, certain situations is because, like I said, that, uh, you know, when you have allies who do just enough for you to, like, have a sustained, uh, you know, income or have a, just enough sustenance for your economy, they will often, uh, you know, not work because uh, what's going to happen is that they'll help you sustain just that amount and that's why oftentimes it takes a long long time for these countries to break down you know um the other thing in sanction is that it's actually like really slow like i said and the public are the ones who are su who suffer the most you know like uh you know people are going to die they're not going to get food medicine whatsoever so at the end of the day is the cost really worth it and eventually like you uh like you've seen with the likes of north korea uh, there's no guarantee that it might work as well so you know you might prefer preferably prefer an intervention as well because it's more direct and it guarantees some level of result or some level of initiative 
but with sanctions is that you put in all that effort you put in all that resources to ensuring that people suffer but at the end of the day they get no result whatsoever you know so that's another thing that's again sanctions as a whole but also what sanctions do it also gives the dictators that basically rule the particular country and uh, the ability to use like the arts versus the mentality which is basically things like you know these people they don't uh, the the uh, the us they don't want you to like you know eat that's why they're essentially putting sanctions on you and all that stuff so uh, sanctions often strengthen the dictator's ability to use like the us versus them uh, rhetoric uh, that they want to do uh, in general i think that's another thing that's they particularly uh, that that is particularly important so yeah um, that's basically the issues with sanctions in general in these debates um, other methods of orchestrating regime change other than sanctions and intervention is that you, you can fund political opposition parties in the countries that you want the want the regime change in so that's something that the us has been doing uh, for a long long time where they pick uh, opposition parties in countries where they want uh, to change the regime and they ensure that their opposition party can put enough pressure on the existing government try to get votes and all that stuff so that's one thing that uh, a lot of countries do in terms of like orchestrating political change in the countries they want to orchestrate in secondly is sponsoring think tanks in the country to change the culture of thinking so for example this is something the usa has done in soviet russia to break down the soviet union I'll, uh, something i'll focus on a bit more in the next slide um, also one ri- another risky thing that they that you can try to do in orchestrating regime change is try to fund violent groups in the nation just to orchestrate political change this is something the usa essentially tried to do in many countries where it backfired quite badly but they ended up funding a lot of terrorist groups in those countries like for example the us funded the mujahideen to fight the soviet uh, to fight so uh, fight soviet russia uh, but then what ended up happening is the mujahideen uh, you know le- mujahideen basically you know, kept all the weapons that the us gave them and they ended up becoming uh, they ended up becoming quite dangerous by the end of the day uh, also this has happened with like the us also funding a lot of militias to to like fight uh, socialist governments all across the south all, all across the uh, south american region which ended up resulting in like a lot of terrorist groups or a lot of drug cartels uh, forming based on the funding that was given by the us so i think these are the uh, these are the few ways i um, mean the us massively messed up like south america because they tried to make regime change they had to they tried to fight socialist governments by funding violent groups that didn't like the socialist governments but what ended up happening is that you know like even the governments changed uh, by the end of the day these groups then became the biggest uh, enemies for the us as they went into the future so um like a bit of bit of like case uh, case study in terms of how the usa uh, what sort of strategies the usa used to break up the so break up soviet russia so for example us based ngos um you know uh work <clears throat> so us based ngos uh who basically you know uh, were undercover uh, they basically set up uh you know in soviet russia as a means of like you know organizations who are willing to help so there are plenty of ngos from from uh, main, multiple countries uh, who had basically set up in soviet russia in order to essentially like you know um, uh, help people under the people and all that stuff so a lot of those uh, ngos basically had connections with the cia and that's how they essentially like you know set up base within that particular country so obviously in russia they will never be allowed to set up a military base or any sort of political base whatsoever so basically then what what end up happen- what end up happening is uh, what end up happening is that you know the people essentially <clears throat> uh, set up their offices within the country with connection to the cia and that's how they slowly start operating from within the country so one of the things that they used to do while operating they founded anti government parties uh, so uh, they founded parties that essentially were anti government uh, that means there were more protests there was a lot of anti government rhetoric that that was that got to keep happening um, in uh, soviet russia so as to ensure that you know there was a lot of unhappiness and frustration with the government that was currently there secondly they spread information about effective street protests so that people could join uh, uh join those protests i e orchestrating a lot of uh, you know uh, action and protest against the particular government they also essentially set up proxy servers 
to help set up unmatchable SMS links. The main point or the main goal behind this was to ensure that effectively these uh, people could organize protests the way they want. Um, also, lastly, yeah, also, uh, lastly, what they were also able to do was that these NGOs were also successfully able to spread ideas about democracies. So what this ha what happened was these NGOs basically en uh, ended up setting up things like you know cultural shows or movie nights and all that stuff, where a lot of people went uh, and watched how great American democracy was or how great life in America was through these films and all that stuff. So that's how basically the USA uh, you know set up uh, its base in Soviet Russia and how they actually helped orchestrate the breakdown of the Soviet Union and the protests that led to the breakdown of the Soviet Union. Uh, this is a very good example of how regime change can happen uh, in a non-violent manner in general. Um, I don't know how effective it's going to be in today's world, but I just think it was just important to know because I felt that it's a really cool strategy that the US set up. Okay, uh, post-war reconciliation debates. Once again, particularly important to notice a few things over here. Number one is with post-war reconciliation, one thing you'll always you'll need to know is that there'll there'll always definitely be a be a power vacuum in the in whenever you try to remove some power. If you look at the likes of Gaddafi or the likes of Muslim Mubarak in Egypt, they've been in power for so long, which means that the moment you remove them, there will be a power vacuum. So the debate is mostly won or lost by the team that effectively shows that how well or how nicely can we fill up this power vacuum with a more efficient process that's been going on. So what mostly happens is the leading opposition party in these particular in these particular countries are the ones uh, who end up filling that power vacuum. So the main opposition party, like in Syria, if people expected that if Bashar al-Assad is going for power, the National Transition Council, the NTC, is likely to be the one that essentially comes into power. In Egypt, uh, they expected, uh, like, uh, you know, they expected uh, the Muslim Brotherhood to come into power. So mostly the power vacuum is filled up by individuals or by parties who have been long-standing political parties historically. And whether or not they have the same incentive to carry out uh, effective democracy or other like to get corrupted is one that's definitely uh, in question. So the so the shared with Muslim Brotherhood was in Egypt was that they were a they were a very Islamist based party and a lot of people weren't necessarily okay with that. Right? So that's why whenever you're debating about a regime change um, and post war reconciliation, it's just good to have a lot of information regarding the leading opposition parties in the particular country and who are likely to fill up that vacuum. Uh, if the ruling party is removed. All right. The other thing that uh, is important about uh, reconciliation debates is that the debate between do you reintegrate the old regime or do you prosecute them? So reintegrating the old regime means that the people who were in power uh, back then, like uh, the army, the ministers, the politicians, do you essentially reintegrate them in terms of like showing the uh, because see the leader who was in power for a long, long time will have a lot of friends because who help them stay in power. But the thing is. If you want the country to move forward, you don't. If you don't want the country to be like a bloodthirsty, you know, uh, you know, revenge factory, you will definitely like uh, want. You will definitely want, you know, some level of peace and prosperity. You would want people to reconcile with, uh, with, uh, you know, your country and with the society moving forward. And that's why there's always an incentive to in terms of like forgiving them. Secondly, these people can actually help the country move forward as well because they have a lot of finance, a lot of power, etc., etc. But the thing is, uh, the risk of reintegrating them is, you if you reintegrate them, uh, there is always a good chance that they will end up fostering all the old policies of the old regime. They will try and hijack the democratic process. They will try and hijack a lot of the, you know, things that uh, essentially uh, they will try and hijack a lot of the things essentially that you want uh, to you know, restructure and all that. So also the other thing is that if their influence is over there, there's a good chance that they keep on coming back to power because the inertia means inertia of new government means that if you are not successful what is likely to happen is they are likely to think that ah the old regime is probably better so we should uh, go back to the old regime in general so i think that's another problem with reintegrating the, re reintegrating the old regime but then again the other problem with not reintegrating them is that they can actually also cause a lot of trouble from outside as well so one thing is definitely like you know if you tell the people who supported the, supported the old regime that you know we are out there looking for blood that means that you know, it's just very, very hard for you to then, as a society, move forward from there. But this other thing is that these people can actually move forward. Um, I think a good case study of that is ISIS. Like, the people who were in Saddam's Ba'ath Party essentially fled away when they realized that the old government is, the new government is going to prosecute them. 
and the moment they essentially fade away, what ended up resulting, uh, what ended up happening was uh, this new, this basically this new government, uh, the, the new government when they started prosecuting Saddam's old uh, party members, Saddam's old party members fled to Jordan, Syria, and places like Iran, where they essentially helped up, help fund ISIS and set up weapons for ISIS and studies for ISIS and all that stuff. So that's another uh, you know thing about old regimes. Like if you don't reintegrate them, the problem is if they're really really influential, they might actually be able to harm you as well. So that's one thing that you have to consider when it comes to post world constitution debate. That do you reintegrate the old regimes or not? Uh, and lastly, in terms of uh, you know post war debates is that like I think the ultimate end goal of regime change is that you probably ideally would want a democracy in in, in all scenarios. But the question is that how do you establish a, a you know a, a functioning democracy? Uh, the thing is with the Arab Spring uh, uh, revolutions that happened in uh, uh, like in the Middle East was that uh, people pushed for democracy but they pushed for democracy a bit too hard which means that even though, when there are certain countries who are economically destroyed or economically absolutely like you know crippled they still had had you know e elections in those countries the economy is really improved and the government who ever, whichever government came into power was under a lot of scrutiny or was under a lot of protests and all that stuff so that's another uh, important part of like re-establishing a democracy is not only like you know they having democracy for the sake of democracy but also establishing it in a manner that is essentially sustainable so that if you look at the arab spring uprising example i think only egypt is the only, sorry only tunisia is the only country where you have had a sustainable democracy in all the other places such as egypt such as uh, libya there is a whole amount of infighting that's happening because these countries are simply not ready uh, for uh, to have elections and all that stuff so that's another thing that we need to actually discuss that even in post-war situations, when is the right time to hold elections? How do we make the most sustainable democracy in these situations? All right. Uh, so now we'll just discuss a bit about terrorism uh, because I think this is also really a common theme that actually comes up in IR debates for uh, more often than not. So the first thing uh, about IR, terrorist groups is that like, so how do terrorist groups operate and how do they grow in general? So the first thing is the way terrorist groups work mostly is through things like indoctrination. So for example, they will spread a lot of the things that about, about themselves through internet, uh, through propaganda videos like ISIS does. Most of, more often than not, what they do is they look they look for you in closed societies, in societies that are basically a, a bit, a, a, a societies that are, that are locked down, that have like, a, that have like a lot of trouble you know, reintegrating with the majority of the country, i.e., enclaves, etc., etc. Those were those are the places where they essentially uh, where they essentially attack uh, the most with their indoctrination. Um, secondly, is who is the target? They prey on individuals who are completely vulnerable. So this might look like people who are unemployed, i.e., people in villages in Bangladesh or India or Pakistan, who are in places like even in places like uh, Hamas uh, and Palestine as well. Individuals who are unemployed, individuals who need to have some level of basic sustenance, and where you know working for these people actually helps them you know feed themselves, feed their family. So that's one thing uh, they essentially try to do is they try to like pick on these vulnerable individuals who are economically vulnerable and uh, promise them some amount of remuneration. The other thing that they also do is that they try on uh, individual individuals who feel like their identity is under attack. For example, this looks like a lot of young Muslims are. Uh, you know, in places like France, Denmark, who essentially ended up uh, joining ISIS because they felt like their communities are never ever going to accept them. Uh, these are often disadvantaged minorities, and the reason why uh, they they become a very lucrative uh, 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 lucrative position is that because these individuals are so discriminated and because these individuals are so badly uh, you know treated in their own societies that they feel like they need some level of community. So they don't really join this terrorist group then because they feel like they want to kill individuals or they want to take revenge or anything. They go there because they market they market, market it as not like a terrorist group that will help you, you know, serve God, but they market it as a place where as a Muslim you will be accepted, you will not be discriminated for your identity and all that stuff. So that's another reason why, you know, a lot of different minorities, young Muslims specifically during ISIS's regime were, were uh, able to go there because of the way they showed that this will give us some level of community in these countries. So how do they do it? How do they draw you towards them? They help you find a common enemy. For example, with the US, with the US bombings, uh, what happens is like if there are young kids in Pakistan or Afghanistan, 
who basically had their homes blown away because the US was a bit careless with the uh, with, with how they use their drones in general so uh, there are a lot of people innocent people who die because of military operations by the USA or by other uh, the government in general so what happens is that uh, you know they often paint the US or the your government as a common enemy and they tell you that you know we'll give you revenge over them because they take took away everything you had uh, from you so we'll also give you the opportunity to avenge the deaths and all that stuff so finding a common enemy is actually quite a good relatable ground that a lot of these people have and that's why it's actually very important a uh, very important you know connection that they establish with you through the through this secondly is like i said they help you find the identity through brotherhood um and that's also something that works for them the last thing is like you know what happens is that you also as a human being uh, you also feel less helpless when you join there because one of the most important uh, parts about you know terrorist group is that uh, often when when they have this sort of grand displays like 911 they actually market it as listen we are the only uh country that's actually doing something about justice we're the only so we're the only group that's actually doing something about justice we're the only group that actually you know is getting uh stuff done for you we're the only ones fighting back so often a lot of people who feel like you know the west is against islam and all that stuff often join terrorist groups because they feel like yes they're actually doing something or they're actually uh you know they're actually like you know helping us uh regain our identity or helping us fight the war for ourselves so that's another reason why why a lot of people who are already have victim mentality are actually drawn towards them and like i said they reach out to you through internet through propaganda often also the, what they do is they will have uh, often what they also do is they'll have like you know recruiters in your own community who are disguised as normal people and their only job is to recruit you so what they will do is they'll look out for young people in your community they will identify whether who is vulnerable who is not vulnerable and they'll slowly try to indoctrinate these individuals into the group so they're also called localized sleeper cells that they have and you'll see that most developing countries or even in certain cases most developed countries have this have sort sort of individuals who are basically normal individuals there's no way for you to tell that they are like they're from a terrorist group and what they what their entire job is just to look out for people and essentially help people you know help recruit people in general um how do they get funding these terrorist groups uh the first way they get funding is they fight proxy wars for international actors so for example one of the main reasons for that is like iran and what they do with hezbollah is that iran doesn't want uh, you know any sunni establishment within the middle east and that's why they fund hezbollah to essentially like you know uh, fight saudi arabia and other sunni groups in that particular region similarly saudi arabia does the same thing as well with uh, you know with wahhabi groups or uh, you know sunni groups to essentially cut out shia influence in multiple regions as well so that's one way they get a lot of funding in general secondly is that a lot of these terrorist groups have donors and sympathizers all across the world and the thing is that and it's actually quite easy to essentially fund like a terrorist group uh, if you think about it because the way they essentially set up their network is that they they'll just use multiple bank accounts to to basically basically retrieve very very small amounts of cash and essentially what happens is that uh, you know they and they Uh, they usually get a lot of funding through these things. for example in this is like bangladesh uh it's actually quite easy in the sense that you, you just need to go to a, a well known uh, you know you just need to go to a well known establishment where you know that there are people who essentially do this sort of stuff and it's completely legal in many cases where you'll basically uh, ask them to donate to a particular ngo or particular charity and that's how they essentially fund, it gets funneled to to multiple accounts whatsoever and in spite of a lot of governments knowing that this thing happens it's just impossible to trace that where do this fund where do this essentially essential funding come from um so that's another uh, way they get funding to lakshan last in terms of natural resources of the area they cover so one of the reasons why isis and al qaeda actually want to like you know control huge parts of uh, huge geographical areas or huge parts is because you know uh, basically they know that because they know that these parts uh, give you a lot of natural resources like say for example uh uh yeah uh, so al qaeda wants or taliban wants to remain in the hilly areas of afghanistan because they can sell opm in those places and get money for themselves the likes of isis uh, wanted to take over iraq and syria is because they know that if they get control of those areas they can drill oil and they can sell that oil at really cheap prices to sustain themselves so yeah that's basically wha- how they get a lot of funding in general right um strategies to tackle terrorism Uh, there are multiple ways in which you can tackle uh, ter- terrorism and there have been a lot of debates regarding this one is like uh, 
one is like through decapitation uh, versus collateral damage for example de decapitation is basically the strategy of taking out the head of the terrorist groups no matter what but the problem with that is that you invite a lot of lot of like you know uh, collateral damage as well so for example uh, with especially with things like drone strikes and whatnot uh, you can essentially try uh, to decapitate leaders but what happens is that in that process you end up killing a lot of like innocent individuals that ends up fueling a lot of like anger against a particular uh, government or that ends up fueling a lot of like you know anti uh, you know us sentiment given that the us is the one that's trying to do so and often in a lot of cases collateral damage like i said often actually funds a lot of, or fuels a lot of the recruitment uh, directly for a lot of the terrorist groups in the first place so that's one uh, that's basically one uh, area um, that is you need to watch out for because decapitation obviously it has its purposes like if you take out the head of the terrorist group uh, you know there's a huge power vacuum there are multiple people who want to go after the power vacuum which results in a lot of which results in basically a lot of issues uh, in the terrorist group as a whole because there are people who are actually grabbing for power secondly when people are decapitated uh, you know that uh, you know there was someone who gave out information and that causes a huge amount of miscommunication within the chain of command and all that stuff so you know, those things particularly you essentially need to uh, take care of uh, if there is some other decapitation but then once again decapitation the issue with that is it's often uh, when you try to go go for it all out uh, it there's a lot of collateral damage you essentially need to watch out for uh, the other part is that do you want to negotiate with terrorists or not uh, so you can so the us has a policy of no negotiations that they sacrifice i think very quite recently uh, during obama's reign where they basically uh, you know exchange a few soldiers for prisoners uh, but once again this is a huge topic is because like obviously you don't want to give recognition to terrorists in the sense that uh, you know by negotiating with them but the other part is that often there's a lot of public pressure that forces you to negotiate with them because there are innocent people who get caught by them who they use as ransom and the other part is that you know when uh, these terrorist videos they make decapitating like you know beheading people uh, this causes a fear factor within the within the public itself the reason why they exclude it to the public is because if the public sees this there's a lot more pressure on the government to negotiate with terrorists because if you know that your loved one is caught amongst those people and there there's a potential that they're likely to be beheaded uh, that's when you like to put more pressure on the government to negotiate with terrorists in general so that's when you basically ask the question that we know that this is a power move that terrorists are trying to make so do we ne negotiate with them or uh, because you know then we're giving them the power but then again do you want the public on your side or not and essentially like uh, you know uh, cater to cater to them and try to bring back the loved ones that they have this is a government you might have the responsibility to take care of these individuals uh, lastly you can have some level of structural changes which is to say like the government of bangladesh after the increase of ter terrorism during the isis era basically mobilized a lot of ngos to provide a lot of education and jobs in areas that they essentially could not reach out to so for example uh, organizations like brac essentially in bangladesh went into multiple rural areas gave people education tried to get them jobs migrated loans and all that stuff that led to them becoming self sufficient and independent um so one of the main ways to like tackle terrorism in a non violent way is to just basically have some level of structural changes that helps people come out of poverty because if there are no poor people in this in these areas uh this means a lot of the ways in which they recruit actually basically goes uh down the drain but then again once again the question is that do all of the countries have the resources to do so uh um, and that's when there's a huge question about uh, uh no and the other thing is that you can ask them like why doesn't the us just fund countries to have structural changes instead of directly fight terrorism the other thing is that uh, the us doesn't really want to take the risk because in parliament the politicians are likely to say that um it's just very very unlikely that uh, you know there is going to be zero corruption which means if we give them money uh, this will go in in the pockets of the politicians and it don't essentially go help go back to uh, funneling or channeling funds to like poor people and helping them the other thing is that it's just easier to argue that you know if there is a military intervention at least you know what's going on and you can directly impact change rather than depending on a third party uh, while making structural changes uh, lastly is that a lot of terrorist groups and the way to tackle terrorism is that a lot of countries have what they try to do is have some level of political inclusivity so in afghanistan you've seen the taliban trying to be reintegrated by the us government in uh, colombia 
the government tried to hold a referendum where they basically promised that the FARC rebels uh, will enjoy some level of political immunity if they surrender. Secondly, they'll also be allowed to stand in politics and all that stuff. So political invisibility actually was a long way in terms of solving all of the problems because a lot of the terrorist groups know that they might not be able to sustain in the long run and they will look for a way out. A lot of members of the terrorist group actually look for a way out and they know that the best uh, way out is to have immunity and get some level of political inclusivity where they can still hold up their agendas but then have a non-violent uh, faction. The other benefit is that if a political, if a terrorist group becomes a political act, uh, they will obviously need votes and that's that's when when they need votes they obviously can't do things like attacks or like things like kidnappings or have like extremely horrible rhetoric because they know that they need to moderatize to a, a certain extent so that's another way like you know uh, you can essentially make terrorist groups reintegrate into society by making them part of like the political faction of the particular country but then the other uh, problem with that is that if you allow them back into politics um, and if you give them a legitimate platform this means that if they do come into power at some point of time, means that they have a huge incentive to abuse things uh, straight away. But secondly, do you want to give voices which are so like terrifying a political platform in the first place? Because to a large extent, these are people who have ruled by fear, the people who have caused divisions in society uh, as rogue entities. If you give them a legitimate platform, there's a good chance that they'll probably do it again. So that's also something you essentially need to look out for when it comes to debates about terrorism and how to tackle terrorism in general all right um, that's basically it for the video uh, i hope you guys liked it um, and you know thank you so much for watching uh, if there are any specific questions that you might have about this particular video uh, you can find me on facebook and uh, drop a question over there i'll be more than happy to answer them uh, for you thank you so much